How's it going everyone? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is my review of Jackbox 7, the 2020 installment of the yearly party game collection. While it's a collective multiplayer experience that you can play either in person or remotely, only one person ever needs a copy of the game. Everyone else then joins and plays through their phones or some other device by simply going to jackbox.tv. No apps needed, which is really cool. As the series has become increasingly popular and more and more commonly streamed, I've been trying to really keep that in mind when reviewing the last few packs. But this year, I also want to put a distinct focus on in-person, through live streams, or over a remote call. Each has their time and place, and depending what's an option to you at the moment, this may be one of the biggest deciding factors. As a blanket statement, while the individual games allow for a minimum of two or three players, most of these games will only really be enjoyable with at least five or six and the closer you can get to 8, the better. Otherwise, your matchups are a little too limited, cooperation becomes too easy, and the smaller pool of potential laughs and general contributions will noticeably lessen the experience. I'll go through each of the five games individually, while summarizing my overall thoughts on this pack at the end. Quiplash 3, made for 3 to 8 players, our sequel of this pack, and the return of an absolute staple from Party Packs 2 and 3. We've been overdue for a third one of these. Quiplash is the same game you know and love. There really is isn't much new to explain here. We have the return of our wonderful host Schmitty and the same old straightforward who's funnier gameplay. Each player receives two prompts. Each one will be held in common with someone else in the room. Each one of your answers is then pitted against that other player. From there, it's a majority rule of who wins the match. Simple, yet endlessly fun. This has always been a go-to for us. I know a few people who don't like the pressure to be funny and dislike this game for that reason, but we really love it. In addition to a wild amount of new prompts, the experience is aided even further by allowing you to create and add your own, as well as integrating contributions from other sources. And with that, you'll literally never run out of new prompts. While the game is the same old, same old, there are a few minute quality of life additions. There's now a character count on your phone when answering the prompts, which helps so much, and I really wish existed all the time. Too often you realize your answer is too long once you've typed out 90% of it. Now you can plan ahead a little better. The first two rounds play out the same, but the third round is the new Thrip Lash. Unlike previous packs where everyone is addressing the same prompt, here you are still put head to head like in the rest of the game. You'll have one singular prompt that you must then give three short answers to, like really short. Each one is only 30 characters. If there are an uneven number of players, someone needs to go against Schmitty himself. This final round is super challenging, and I'd recommend turning on the extended timers specifically for this round. But as you would expect, the ability to deliver comedy in threes works very well. The third round is maybe a weak point in the overall experience, but the final round in Quiplash has kind of always been rough, and I'd way rather have this than Acro Lash. So yeah, I'd say it's still a step up. I personally love the claymation look of everything. I've heard some say they really dislike the look of this moving clay, and there is actually a motion sick mode. So if this is already making you queasy, you can turn it off and it will dial back the animation. I will say, the circusy music has a very odd, unsettling feel to it. It borderline made me feel anxious? But I think that's me really reaching for something to complain about. I, it's not a big factor. In some small way, the game feels underwhelming because it's literally just more of the same game. But in no way did I want anything else from Quiplash 3, so that's definitely not a complaint. Whether it's in person, on call, or through a live stream, Quiplash is as great as ever. The Devils and the Details, made for 3 to 8 players. It's not often that Jackbox includes a cooperative game, and luckily this one is the sort of me-first cooperative, where you can and should be looking out for yourself as much as the collective. You play as a family of demons that must work together to complete household tasks and blend in with your human suburban neighborhood. Players will be grouped as adults, teens, and children, having a different pool of tasks based on their demon's age. It's a difficult game to show because 95% of it's happening on your individual phones. I set up a separate recording of me playing it on the computer so I have something to show you guys. The main game screen has a few useful pieces of information like points, family score, and the selfish meter, but the real game is on your phones or devices. 
tasks are completed by doing a series of simple WarioWare-like minigames on your device. Many of them require direct communication between two or more players. In those instances, one player has info that needs to then be fed to whoever is helping. Say you're navigating using a map, so the other player knows where to turn their car. Or you have to describe a bird that the other player then picks out from a flock. Or you'll have a series of specific toggles and dials that need to be set to those precise settings on the other device. Communication is key. This feels a lot like Space Team or Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. If you've ever played and enjoyed either of those games, you're gonna love this. You'll be shouting over one another, trying to work with whoever you're currently paired with as best as you can, and communications are regularly going to break down. Some people will be totally put off by this chaos, but we loved it. It's so easy to get flustered, cross wires, and need to start a task over. The one-player tasks are mostly busy work and worth less points. Cooperating is going to help you and the family, but you can quickly use the one-player tasks to fill in time if nobody's available to help with anything paired. Keep an eye out for the yellow challenge tasks, as they are working towards a larger goal of the scenario you were given and are worth more points. I like the tie-in of there being some sort of story with each day. Your family unit works through three different days, and in each one needs to end above a certain threshold of completed tasks to move on to the next. The hook that makes this game about more than just random yelling through simplistic minigames is your ability to take on selfish tasks. They are solo tasks that you'll attempt to complete privately while everyone else is distracted. These earn big points for you, but raise the group's selfish meter and risks outing the family to the neighborhood. If too many of these tasks are collectively completed, everything comes to a crashing halt to avert catastrophe. This could be a massive fire or flood, every player is going to have to frantically contribute to clear the mess as quickly as possible, and get back to regular tasks. Everyone has to pay for your selfishness. If anyone sees you engaging with a selfish task, they may intervene. They stop you through yet another minigame, and if your selfishness is stopped in time, they instead earn points. There's a really awesome balance there. It's in everyone's best interest to work together, but it's in your best interest to be selfish. And yet again, it's in everyone else's best interest to stop you from being selfish. That combination makes this game outstanding. At the end of each day, it tallies your family score and specifically shows who spent time on selfish tasks. Now you know who's unreliable and who needs to be watched out for. The Devils in the Details needs a special commendation for the incredible sitcom intro with its unique theme song. It's so good! The art, animation, and overall production value here is some of the best ever seen in a party pack. Our impression is that in-person would be the best option. You can then look someone directly in the eye, work together a little easier, and better communicate while keeping an eye on the activities of the full group. It'll still be chaos, but maybe a little more manageable. Overcall still worked well enough, but it's easy to lose track of people and becomes really hard to talk over one another. Especially in our first attempt when we didn't use real names, we had no idea what was going on. And I I really don't think this game can work over stream. A solo streamer can never really play this with just an audience without a voice chat set up, and that's bound to cause issues with potential trolls. There's just really no way to communicate without that. Anyone who plans to play in person or through calls is going to have a great time, and if you have friends to stream with, you're probably good, but there are limits there. It's nice to have games in the pack where there's no pressure to be funny, or a point in time where you're the center of attention, but I can understand that this gameplay might frustrate some players a bit too much. We loved it but it'll come down to personal taste. Champed Up, again for 3-8 to eight players. After having no drawing-based games last year, this is a welcome addition. I tend to personally love the drawing games in Jackbox, with Drawful 2 still being one of their all-time best games. I love Bidiots, even though I know many do not. I dislike TKO, even though I know there are many who love it. Civic Doodle was fun at first, but my opinion changed on it pretty quickly, and Patently Stupid can be a lot of fun, but needs the right group. So while the drawing games are always interesting and welcome, they have rarely been the standouts of the pack. That's why it brings me great joy to say here, Champed Up may have been our favorite game of the entire pack. The concept has drawings fighting one another for supremacy in a very clever way. This may seem similar to TKO, but while that game was mostly shock-driven and really suffered from a recency bias, Champed Up is fueled by a thrilling combination of comedy and some luck. Drawing ability is typically not important. 
It's also great to have Cookie Masterson back hosting this one, and quickly I want to say, the in-round music while you're drawing is just incredible. Seriously, it's just so good. This game plays out in two rounds. In round one, everyone is given a prompt of a champion you must draw. This could be the champion of regret, or the champion of producing fluids. What you have to go off of is going to be weird, and your resulting submissions are going to be equally weird, and that's really the whole point. You then name your champion and submit. Everyone is presented with someone else's named drawing. They are not told what that player's original prompt was. You have to guess what they were going off of and attempt to draw a challenger for that title. Was the sad lumpy muck luck drawn based on the champion of sadness? The champion of bad luck? The champion of goop? You really don't know. In a funny way, this actually somewhat becomes a combination of drawful and TKO. In the arena, these two drawings go head to head, now revealing to everyone what the original prompt was. We are not told which one was drawn in response to that prompt, and which one was freeballing it. These submissions are trying to earn votes from the other players based on who best fits that title. Points are earned based on votes, with the challenger earning additional underdog points, since it was coming in without ever knowing the prompt. It should be disadvantaged, and it's compensated for that accordingly. Round 2 is where things get wild. Creating a champion and challenger works the same, but the fighters duking it out in the arena is now a two-step process. The first is a vote much like the original, but after, a totally new champion title is presented that neither drawing was made in response to. The artists then have the option to keep their fighter in the arena, or, and this is the best part, tag in either of their drawings from the first round. This is the beauty of there being no recency bias. If anything, it opens this amazing avenue of callback humor, where older drawings are maybe even advantaged. Maybe your fighter was a total dud in its original round, but perfectly applies here? It becomes so ridiculous, and the votes are cumulative. Your success is really going to ride and die on whether or not you tag out. As an incentive to put it all on the line, you can earn bonus points by not tagging in another fighter. There's this amazing tension where you don't know if your opponent's going to keep in their fighter, and if they choose to swap, who they're bringing in. So it's another blind match where anything is possible. The beauty of this and what made us keep coming back to this game is if you play multiple games in a row, you can tag in any of the drawings you've made across those multiple games. It builds up so quickly, becomes so unpredictable and just satisfying. This really had some of the biggest laughs we've ever experienced in our many, many years of playing Jackbox. I could not say enough good things about Champed Up. It has the puzzling guessing element of Drawful and the silliness and competitiveness of TKO. It comes together perfectly. This is also the first time playing consecutive games has really mattered. Sure, in Trivia Murder Party, you then get to play as player name Junior or player name the third, but that doesn't add to the game. I don't think Champed Up will ever overstay its welcome, because the game gets better the more you play it. Talking about the actual drawing tools, I want to kiss whoever came up with having separate pen and highlighter tools, where the highlighter always draws under the pen. Coloring things in actually works well finally. The color palette is super Super limited, but it's kind of a fun, distinct set of colors, so it often results in fun monstrosities like this green-skinned alt-reality Bart. As usual, there's no eraser, but there is an undo button. While we're talking quality of life features, a cool addition is that when a round begins, the two minute countdown is delayed until the last player starts drawing or 15 seconds have elapsed. It's a great way to encourage you to stop and quickly consider what you want to draw. Champed Up is an absolute gem, and it's going to be equally enjoyable in person through a call or live streaming. With the first group, we caught on relatively quickly, but I played with another's where a few just did not get it right away, and the game is really no fun if people don't get the whole challenger setup or the tagging in and out, just be sure not to skip the tutorial the first time through, it's still a thousand times easier to learn than vidiots. Talking Points is a game again made for 3-8 to eight players, and in a world of Zoom calls, everyone has oddly been training for this game. Essentially, you're giving a PowerPoint presentation, but you don't know what the presentation's gonna be, or what the content of the slides is. There's a quick opening period where everyone is given three prompts. You then fill in the blanks, and everyone is given a random assortment of three presentation titles. Whichever one you choose is the presentation you're giving. That's it, that's all the preparation you have. When it's your turn to be the speaker, a random other player will be assigned to be your assistant. Your presentation is going to start with an intro, which is the title of the presentation, and from there we'll alternate text, photo, text, photo, text, photo, and then closing remarks. Your assistant is in charge of giving you your next text and photo slide. They're frantically looking at a selection of approximately six options on their
their phone that they then choose from. You're not going to know what they chose until you hit next slide and see it at the same time as everyone else in the room. The challenge is then trying to string together something vaguely coherent, sticking to the topic of your presentation, and lacing those text and photos into your talk. This may sound like the shy person's worst nightmare, but we found that the improv nature of it actually takes some of the pressure off. This makes me think of Patently Stupid. In that game, there were so many independent steps of you creating inventions and writing up slogans for them. There was so much planning before your eventual presentation that when things didn't match, weren't funny, and didn't come together coherently, it falls flat and you can really hear the crickets in the room. Because there's a general understanding that you're making this up on the spot, people are probably going to laugh along with you no matter where your presentation takes you. Because with this rocket of, uh, of bologna and ketchup sandwiches, we're propelling forward with so much energy that you didn't realize we packed into bologna and also into ketchup. The presenter can also write on the slides if they choose, and type. Just being able to scribble around on things, maybe draw an arrow or circle something in particular, can add a lot. There is no chance you're going to be able to type and talk at the same time while making everything up. There's a weird catch-22 there, where typing on the slides is probably the only way the audience can participate for a solo streamer, but you're probably going to want to disable that feature since it's next to impossible to moderate. Everyone else in the room who's not the speaker or assistant tracks your presentation throughout as frequently as they choose. They're sliding a finger along a 0 to 10 pole, literally a pole, and at the end of the round, the average reception of your presentation on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is graphed out and points are awarded the more people liked your talk. The assistant is also rewarded for your talk being well received, so there's an incentive for them to not totally screw you over, although based on the randomness of it, there's almost no way they can truly help you or screw you. Every Everyone is given a small moment where they can then submit their favorite quotes or comments from your talk. This ties back in at the end, and isn't worth points, it's just kind of fun. After all the talks have been given, everyone then gets to choose their own award to hand out. It's up to you what that award is. It could be the most funny, the most gross, the most informative. Be creative with it. The whole point is that you can make it hyper specific, and then directly hand it to who you think it applied to. The awards are actually worth points, something we weren't originally aware of, and is a feature I kind of wish could be disabled. It really seemed to work out that the award ceremony determined who won the round more so than those graphs, and that felt marginally unfair. I think instead it maybe should have randomly assigned every player in the room to someone else. You have to create an award that you then give to them, and it's worth no points. It's a fun reason to just have an extra laugh, and doesn't end up determining the whole game. At the end, during this award ceremony, you'll see a little snippet of that presentation, along with the comments that everyone submitted. It got so off the rails so quickly that we were nearly in tears years laughing at this one. While I do think that people who have anxiety with public speaking are probably going to struggle with this one, it's not as scary as you'd think since everyone really is laughing with you. And the whole point is that the worse your presentation goes, potentially the funnier it'll be. I'm sure this would work well in person, hilariously because of months of Zoom calls and meetings, it almost felt more appropriate playing it remotely, and through stream, you're only going to be able to play it with actual other people who can talk. So again, unfortunately, single player streamers aren't really going to get anything out of this game. And finally, we have Blather Round. This one is made for two to six players, with four other really strong games. This one is maybe the weakest one of the pack, even though we did still enjoy it. There is something really frustrating about the fact that it caps out at six players. It may have felt overly long or a little overwhelming with eight players, but there was no reason to not allow that. We were playing with seven, and we just had to wait till a point in the night when someone left before we could finally try this one. It feels a little bit like charades, combined in some small way with the board game Taboo. Maybe not that one specifically, but those sort of word association games. Everyone is given a selection of three different places, things, or stories that they're going to attempt to describe to the group. You have the option to select a new random batch one time, and if you don't like those three, too bad you're kind of stuck with them. One of these three choices is labeled easy, and even though I think none of them particularly felt easier than others, you'll want to keep in mind that this one will give less points than the other two if and when others get it correct. After picking what your specific thing is going to be, you're then given two lists of descriptive words. You're using these adjectives and nouns to fill in a prompt along the lines of, it's a story of blanky blank. Everyone sets up this starting point before the actual game begins. When it's your turn to be the presenter, everyone else will be shown that initial sentence you crafted with those filled in blanks. They can then immediately start guessing what they think it may be, while you are frantically trying to give additional clues 
words in the same blank filling fashion. It's really interesting to try and come up with unique ways to describe something. The presenter was using the word dry every time. It was a story, and we quickly picked up on that being doom. At other times, your pool of words might feel a little too limiting. There's kind of a luck of the draw aspect there. Sometimes you just feel like your hands are tied, and you don't know what to do, time is ticking away, and people are nowhere near the right answer. There was a little bit of a luck aspect that seemed to really bring certain rounds crashing down. Luckily, if you feel your pool of words sucks, you can skip and try again. You're losing time, but at least you're not locked into submitting a clue that's going to point people in the complete wrong direction. There is also an interesting ability to specifically use people's guesses in your clues. You could say something is a lot like that guess, or not at all like that guess. It's bigger than that guess, or in the same genre as. I found that can be really helpful, but it was a presentation method I rarely used myself. Having your word correctly guessed, or guessing the correct word, both earn you points. If the presenter ever uses one of your guesses to then build up their next clue, that also is worth points. During the second round, you go through the same thing, and the points are doubled. It's a pretty simple game overall, but I actually really enjoyed it. It can be frustrating spending two long minutes where someone is completely stuck, but I really appreciated having a low energy game. You've probably been shouting and stressed during the devils in the details, maybe gone through a little bit of anxiety with talking points, and laughing your head off with Quiplash 3 and Champed Up, so Blather Round becomes a very welcome change of pace. You just kind of stop, slow things down, and puzzle it all out. It's not the best game of this pack, but I still really liked it. And this one is going to work no matter how you play it, and is one of the few games in this pack that a solo streamer can actually participate in. Hearing each other isn't actually important in this one. And again, I love that this one has a unique credits theme. That sort of inclusion is just silly and good fun. Talking about the party pack as a whole? This is easily the highest production value I've ever seen. That has never been a shortcoming of these games, but I was just blown away here. Even the menu looks better than any other game. The floating parade balloons are awesome. I kind of wonder if their budget was upped because Jackbox games have been so successful this past year. You can really feel it, and it makes it feel absolutely worth the price tag. I've jumped the gun on this before, thinking a new pack is the best simply because everything feels new and fresh, so I really wanted to take a few days to sit on this one and think about it. Play it a few times with a few different groups, and try not to oversell it. And I think at this point I can confidently say, without a doubt, this is the best Jackbox Party Pack ever. Maybe not so much for streamers, but I'm usually playing these in person or over remote calls with friends. And if that's how you intend to play it, then you're going to get so much out of this pack. A returning classic, cooperative chaos, one of the best drawing games, an excuse to face your fears of public speaking and improv, and a more relaxed word association experience. This pack is so well-rounded. This is the longest of these review videos I've ever made, but I had so much to talk about here because I enjoyed every game so much. They're all thought through so so well. I have a new ranking of my favorite all-time packs. There may be a little hindsight that comes into play here, it may be a little different than how I organized it after last year, but Jackbox 7 is likely the best pack ever made. I can't recommend it enough, I hope you pick it up and have lots and lots of fun. I don't know if that feels so cheesy and stupid, I don't know, I don't want you to have a bad time. Thank you to patrons of the channel, if you'd like to support us yourself there's a link in the description. If you want to see all of these games in action, in the end cards at the end of this video I'll have a link to a playlist where we played them over on the Let's Play channel. Thank you all so much for watching, thank you for tolerating the longer video length, and I'll see you again soon.